in, and I want to say thanks to all of you for coming. We're, we're delighted to have you here. This is, uh, for, this is our opportunity to release the most uh, recent or current of our uh, series of studies that we've been trying to engage in on America's, let me say this, America's national security interests in global good, global health. I mean, it's what this is about, is trying to find a way where America can make a contribution in the world that we need for ourselves and, frankly, the world needs, and to play that very constructive and helpful role. And uh, I'm, very, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that we've been able to continue to draw on the expertise of these two gentlemen uh, here, Bill Fallon and Jim Peek. Um, remarkable leaders in their own right when they were in service uh, and now continue to be remarkable leaders in, in uh, as, I don't know when, how you guys get really paid. I know I don't pay you, but, I, that's, but, <laughs> but it, it doesn't keep them from volunteering with their remarkable capabilities, you know, to advance uh, good things in the world. And we're, I'm very, very grateful to both of you for, for doing that. Um, this, uh, of course, this is, a, this is a project that's now looking at the Mekong Delta and the very serious health issues. Uh, this is undervalued and underappreciated in the American policy landscape. And it needs the attention. It needs to, frankly, be a significant focus for us. Um, again, these are, these are, in many often cases, poor people with desperate need for care that they cannot get themselves. And the international community has a very strong interest in helping to bring solutions to this problem. You know, it's, it's both selfless and self-centered for us to want to do that. It'll be important for our health. And of course, America's standing in the world is always better when we really reach out and help other people with problems that they have. And so it's, a, it's the spirit uh, of this of this project, um, you will find, uh, you all have a copy of the report, and I said to the authors, it's blessedly brief, which is nice. You know, we don't need to make you lead, read lots and lots of words if you get the main point. And I think it's vividly conveyed in a very handsome, concise, taught uh, report and monograph, and we're going to get into that today. Uh, and I'm very grateful that they've, that they've donated so much of their time to make it happen. We've got, uh, you know, very real issues in this region. There's, there's resistant uh, malaria. We've got pandemic threats in the region, vulnerable populations, especially women and girls, vulnerable populations in this region. And, and these are issues that need to be addressed, and we're really grateful that they're here to do that and that you're here to be a part of it. Let me just say there are some people that were, in addition to these, uh, these gentlemen, who were very instrumental in helping with this. Uh, Admiral uh, Cullinson, who is the former Deputy Surgeon General, played a heroic role in getting this, and I appreciate that very much, Admiral. Thank you for, for what you did with us. Chris Daniel, who's a retired captain, physician from the United States Navy. Chris, thank you for, for leading this effort. Lindsay Hammergren, uh, Lindsay's out organizing right now, and so Lindsay, thank you. You've been a real champion for all of this, and I want to say special thanks to Murray Hebert. Now, Murray is a recent uh, uh, practitioner of healthcare. He had appendicitis last week, but he's up here walking around, and he's pretty good, and if we can take care of Murray, we ought to be able to take care of everybody in the Mekong River Delta, I think. So, okay, let's, let's see what we can do. So I'll just say thank you to all of you for uh, a, a very important additional step, a step that we all need to take, and let me turn to the co-chairs of the project, and you guys take it from here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Hamry, uh, thanks uh, very much for uh, a number of things. First, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, Jim Peake and I, I think I'll speak for, uh, try to speak for both of us, and that we're honored to, to be here and to continue an association with CSIS because of the, the uh, wonderful example and leadership that Dr. Hamry and his team uh, demonstrate on a daily basis. And uh, uh, for my part, uh, this particular uh, avenue, if you would, of uh, global health, I think, is particularly interesting and uh, very, very important because one of the things that I learned after uh, many years of working in the field or, so to speak, or on the seas uh, was that uh, security um, means a lot more than just the uh, traditional 
state to state interactions that uh, that I grew up in as a youngster. And over the years, I've come to believe that it's uh, much more personal and uh, close to individuals. And one of the key underpinnings of that is uh, is the personal health of and welfare of uh, of people around the world. Uh, if you're uh, if you're not in good health and you're uh, you're concerned about uh, <clears throat> just uh, existing day to day because of uh, of health or health related issues. Uh, it creates uh, an uncertainty and an instability and insecurity that uh, leads to other uh, much more complex and, and dangerous things. So it's very fundamental. And uh, another one of my strongly held convictions is that you attack challenging problems from both the top and the bottom. We need good leadership. Uh, we need initiative. We need resources. Uh, John Hamry and his gang here certainly give us a good example of that. But we need people on the ground, in the field, actually working the issues if we're going to make progress. And uh, thanks for all of you uh, being here today to uh, listen to us and to hopefully uh, not be shy, which I know you won't be, about offering your suggestions and, and good ideas. So as we looked at this issue, there's a continuum here. I was privileged to be part of a global health uh, study a couple of years back, and Jim uh, has, has also engaged in several um, opportunities here at CSIS to further thinking along this line and see what resources might be matched up against the challenges out there. Um, <clears throat> I saw, certainly from my time in PACOM, as the commander out there, that we had tremendous capabilities <clears throat> that we, not only in the military, but uh, uh, in other uh, aspects of U.S. Uh, capability, government and, and commercial and civilian. And uh, I thought to myself that it would be uh, <clears throat> uh, tremendously helpful if we could figure out a way to get people to cooperate uh, in a, a more useful manner uh, to look at the challenges and look at the resources and then figure out who and what and what the organization is best suited to tackle them. Um, so there are lots of needs, but uh, and certainly no, no small number of people that are willing to help. But uh, getting all this harnessed in a useful way would be uh, was a real challenge. Uh, the other thing that I saw was that we had an opportunity to use one of those uh, major military capabilities uh, uh, while I was out there in the form of uh, one of our big hospital ships. And uh, as we got this thing uh, spun up, uh, of course, there was resistance uh, back here in Washington. Imagine that uh, first question, of course, who's going to pay for this? And uh, went on and on. And then who's going to staff it? And, and then it became very, very interesting uh, uh, that uh, um, there were people clamoring to be part of that staffing. And in fact, we had a, had a, uh, a wonderful, uh, overwhelming uh, number of folks here who were, who were willing to step up. Uh, but uh, on the downrange side of things, uh, there were many folks who had raised their hands and said, can you send that asset here? And um, so it was very, very useful, and I'm happy to see that continues. But one of the lessons from this endeavor was that um, there wasn't a whole lot of what I would call staying power uh, from these kinds of things. And in fact, that's it's very, very true of most of our military capabilities. We, we have a lot of things we can do very quickly. We can bring relief rapidly, and we can, uh, we can figure out how to do logistics very well. But uh, we can't stick around forever. And if these things are going to be effective, they need to be uh, uh, long term. And so uh, that's uh, one of the motivations for this, uh, this particular exercise, was to think about what, not only what could be done, um, but how it could be done and exactly where we would, we would spend the effort. So it's back to this. Um, the key question for us is how do we pull together the resources and leverage the different uh, interests and capabilities to actually make a difference, a long-term difference on the ground, not just to help somebody uh, feel better today, but uh, to actually improve the long-term health. So uh, um, how do we go about it? Uh, first of all, you. Our experience was that we need to think about it. Uh, we need to gather up uh, a group of people that are experts in this field that have a tremendous amount of experience. 
And uh, we've been very, very blessed to have many of those folks on the team that thought through this. And then uh, gathering information, what is it we need to know? What are the facts on the ground that we need to take into consideration? And then uh, come up with a plan. Um, we can deviate from the plan, but we've got to have some framework for figuring out what we do, how we do it. And so that's what uh, uh, effort was, uh, was spent doing. And then uh, another question would be uh, lots of needs all over the world. Um, <clears throat> is there something that makes sense in a particular area that would address uh, certainly the needs, um, the capabilities that could be brought to bear, and then the other things that are always lurking in the background that serve to either motivate people to jump on board and be part of the solution or on the negative side to cause them to shy away and say, you know, this is too complex, too hard, too many sticky fingers, whatever the, whatever the issue is. So uh, without boring you, uh, Southeast Asia seemed a very, very appropriate uh, target for our efforts. Uh, the needs are certainly there. Uh, we have seen some uh, outreach in the recent past to work in this area. And there's some wonderful opportunities uh, in and around the Mekong River uh, Valley uh, in this day and age uh, that we thought would help pull in some of these other factors. And one of them is, frankly, uh, China. Uh, we in the U.S. side have been looking for ways to try to get China engaged in activities that would be helpful in the world, not competitive, but uh, complementary to things that we might be doing. And is there a, uh, a venue and is there a, uh, uh, an idea that we could uh, kind of come to, come to agreement on and move forward? And so uh, that, that's a, a big potential play in this area. Um, U.S. government, U.S. military capabilities, interesting, uh, certainly, but uh, how many other things are out there in the private world? And how many individuals uh, are out there doing? The answer is lots. And so the challenge is to come up with a coherent plan that we could hopefully get folks to buy in. And that's one of the reasons you've been invited here today is to uh, have you hopefully understand what it is we're proposing. Uh, we would hope to uh, agree and get your support and then to help us carry this into execution uh, as, we, as we move forward. It seemed to me that uh, one of the critical pieces that had to be put in line for this effort to be successful was the uh, active uh, help from my former command out there in Honolulu, U.S. Pacific Command. And the, the reason why is that uh, PACOM has an enduring presence for many decades in the region, and it touches every one of the countries out there, and it also touches back here in Washington, most of the institutions. And uh, if we had any chance of being successful, we needed not only the ascent of uh, Pacific Command, uh, but the active participation of the leadership there and then the staff people that would help to uh, facilitate uh, carrying this thing out. And so I was really, really happy to have the team uh, go out there and to, to get the uh, support from uh, the commander and, and the rest of uh, peop people out there. Uh, last thing that I would highlight, and I think uh, we need to talk about this, I'd encourage your, your inputs, is that if this is going to work, it's going to require a very, very good integration of efforts, particularly back here in Washington. So uh, the White House uh, supporting it, and so this is an initiative that we are proposing that, that might be uh, taken forward by the President himself as he reaches out uh, into Asia later on this year. Uh, we certainly need uh, support from the uh, Cabinet uh, Secretaries from Defense and State and and others, and then other non-DOD uh, non organizations around town, linking that through, uh, through the State Department and down through our country teams and our ambassadors, and then, of course, the various military folks on the ground. So getting all of these folks to sign up uh, to support this initiative and to actively help us to move it forward is a key objective. So thanks for the opportunity to be with you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with Dr. Peek and the other folks who were uh, wonderfully kind in donating their time, uh, Chris, for, for honchoing this thing and, uh, and seeing it through and dealing with a couple of farts like us who 
never seem to be able to make meeting times and you know the usual usual nonsense but uh, so uh, Jim I turn it over to you for your thoughts thanks very much well first uh, I'd also just like to add my thanks to CSIS and to the team uh, chance to work with Admiral Fallon here is always fun um, and as I look out of the audience I see a number of the folks in the audience who participated in our in our variety of deliberative meetings about this and in addition to the team that's on the front row and I wanted to uh, thank you all uh, as well for your participation. Um, my, my approach on this is, uh, you know, from a guy that spent uh, most of his life in the military, in the medi military medical side, and when you realize the stake in global health is just fundamental to our mission of taking care of the soldier, sailor, airman, and marines, because we never know where we're going to wind up sending them. This is more than an academic exercise, and it's why for more than 50 years, both the Navy and the Army have had a research laboratory presence uh, in the Southeast uh, Asia region. Um, in fact, we were part of a study that looked at that and uh, talked about their contributions to readiness, um, the contributions to scientific advancement in general, as an example, the HIV vaccine that you all have heard about uh, would not have had that kind of trial in Thailand without that sustained presence um, by the Army Lab in that case um, that represented also the longevity of these laboratories and kind of a, a strange resilience there in some ways that's fundamental, uh, fundamentally built on trust. It's mill to mill, scientist to scientist that has been the, the hallmark of their, uh, their excellence as well as a network regionally. It's not just the host country, but it's the, the regional network that has been important in maintaining that kind of viability. Um, more recently, CSIS has looked at that the last 10 years, really, of Navy humanitarian uh, assistance within the Pacific. Um, and Admiral Fallon alluded to it with uh, the, it really started with the response to a disaster of the tsunami um, with the, the tremendous force of the United States Navy with the uh, USS Lincoln and so forth, as well as the uh, follow-on with the USS Mercy, or the U United States uh, Naval Ship Mercy. Um, but the emphasis was on the follow-on pre-planned medical engagements, um, with the idea that you start to get to the sustainability uh, that Admiral Fallon really talked about. And so there have been follow-on on alternate years really into the Pacific um, with the big white ships, as well as using other naval assets um, that can bring medical support right into the, to the coast and, and um, uh, in conjunction with the, the variety of host nations. That also has gone down into um, South America and Central America. And then there are similar, not quite the same, but similar kind of exercises uh, in Africa. Um, so it is that sort of thoughtful use of military medical support. Um, now, that is also in conjunction really with some of the other, uh, the variety of other agencies. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But then you say, well, why if we look at the Pacific Southeast Asia? And when you think about it, there's obviously a, a compelling area because of its strategic location, um, sort of hemmed in by the Straits of Malacca on the south and China on the north. Uh, that makes it fairly strategic just looking at that. Um, but it is also an area that is host to what may well be the next pandemic. Uh, it is lots of emerging infectious disease concerns uh, within this area of uh, of the Mekong watershed, if you will. Um, it is also an area with the disparities in health that um, are important to all of us in this, in, here on this committee and on this audience. I mean, if you think about um, um, the Southeast Asia compared to just East Asia, uh, the under five death uh, rate is about um, 32 per thousand versus 18 per thousand in East Asia. The maternal death rate is 150 per 100,000 versus 37 per 100,000 in East Asia. So when you start looking at the variety of objectives that we would have in focusing on this region, not to say that there are not other areas of the Pacific um, that will require our long-term initiatives and our long-term presence, but a place to start as we rebalance to the Pacific um, 
that gives us a chance to work with already existing programs, um, our own with USAID and CDC, actively engaged there, but others, WHO, the Global Fund, all of those kinds of things coming together, the chance for synergy and making a real difference seemed to be a, a compelling uh, approach um, to, the, to the group that's been working this. Um, so when you start saying, well, what, what's it going to take to be able to put that kind of thing together, given all the good intentions, it really focuses on leadership. And we believe, as, as uh, Admiral Fallon talked about, that that can be really strengthened from the, the very, very top. Um, but it will take more than just that voice. It means a dedicated leader, we think of the ambassadorial level, uh, to be able to start to tie all of these pieces together. Uh, it will take a, a sum of money that will be able to leverage already the investments that are being made, but a sum of money that would be dedicated that will then enable, if you will, um, the smart collaboration between and among the U.S. International, uh, and other international entities, particularly finding ways to work with China. We think that's a, an absolutely important consideration. Um, and to bring in also the, the uh, power of the private sector, which, I mean, there's some $160 billion of investment that the private sector has made in that region already, so they're vested interests. And if they could be aligned, then I think that, and, and the, the group feels like that is the opportunity to start to make a significant difference in this area, near term and long term, in a sustainable manner. So with that, I think we want to get the, the panel up here. And I would like to thank all of you again for being here and again for the CSIS for the opportunity to be a part of this. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Fallon and General Peake, uh, John Hamry, for, for uh, kicking this off. Um, and I want to reiterate the thanks to uh, Chris Daniel, Murray Hebert from the Southeast Asia Program. We've done this initiative jointly with the Southeast Asia Program, and we've, we've enjoyed enormous support from CDC, from USAID, and from the Pacific Command. <laughs> Um, uh, we started this work uh, with the idea that in, in the year 2013 that the strategic rebalance would get uh, continued consideration around what does it mean and what, what would, is, is a, a smart, affordable, and actionable option, soft power option centered in health for the U.S. to push forward on. And that's what we've laid out here in this, in this um, uh, short proposal. Uh, is the argument around the timeliness, the urgency, the ability, the opportunity to move forward. We're putting a bit special focus on Artemis and resistant malaria, a special focus on building preparations and capacities with partner countries uh, to, uh, to respond to emerging threats, pandemic flus. We're, we're talking about mobilizing our efforts in a more unified way around maternal and child health. Um, we think this is a very, very powerful and valid uh, proposal will be, uh, it builds on the work that we did on the labs uh, with General Peak and, and with others. Um, it, it builds uh, on the work that we did and issued earlier this, this year on the uh, naval hospital ships and the other forms of humanitarian engagement. Uh, we issued late last fall an elaborate oral history of 15 different civilian and military leaders who had been active in natural disasters and conflict settings. Uh, and in other, uh, other unsettled circumstances in, in talking about the role that health plays. So this marks a big, big moment for us programmatically in the stream of work and putting this piece out. We'll be a, a delegation, uh, Admiral Cullison, uh, Murray Hebert, myself, Lindsay, or, and Ta uh, Todd Summers from our program, who works with the Global Fund, will be in Myanmar uh, and, and in Thailand shortly, and will issue in September a short analysis around the state of play and the opening in Myanmar and what that means in the health sector and in terms of U.S. interests. We'll also, on November 12th in our new building, 
be hosting a day-long major conference on health in Southeast Asia. And we'll have folks from within, the, from within the region, the leadership on the health side, from within the region there. And we'll have senior, senior personalities from the Obama administration. We'll have personalities from some of the major international partner institutions like Gavi Alliance, Global Fund, um, and folks representing the Hill. I want to acknowledge we have with us today a group of 16 scholars who are foreign policy experts from around the world who've been in the United States, uh, hosted by Bard College in Joy Monegal. Uh, who are here today, and thank you all for being here. And I hope you'll stand up and speak in the in the period when when we move towards audience participation. We have uh, foreign policy academic experts from Vietnam, Cambodia, and India with us today, among many other countries represented in that group. Uh, this roundtable discussion is meant to to hear from four different individuals in leadership positions in four different agencies of our government to hear their outlook on how they see uh, the bigger picture in terms of strategic rebalance and the role of health. We're not asking them to comment per se on the report and proposal that's in front of them, although they are certainly free to do that. But we're, we're, and we've asked each of them, starting with Michael Fuchs from the State Department, uh, to offer some opening remarks around how that what their outlook is on this big, enormous, very timely question. We'll hear from them, and I'll introduce them each in a moment. We'll hear from them, and then we'll come back for a round of discussion. And I'm going to ask Admiral Cullison, Tom Cullison, who's been so integral to mm -hmm. all of our work, to, to kick forward uh, the discussion with, with a question from Tom. Uh, and then we will turn to you all. Uh, so we'll try to get to you all. Uh, uh, for your comments and input uh, rapidly. And uh, there are folks here uh, who are working with us who, who have microphones. And when we get to the uh, question and comment period, we'll just ask you to put your hand up. We'll bundle together three or four comments and questions in a, at a time and come back to our folks. And we'll conclude by 2 p.m. So thank you very much on that. Uh, our first speaker is Michael Fuchs, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of State in the uh, Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Um, prior to that, uh, played a, a major role over several years as special advisor on a number of strategic initiatives and uh, uh, advising Secretary Clinton, uh, was in the policy planning staff there. Prior to that, was at the uh, Center for American Progress and did some very uh, terrific work with Mort Halpern uh, on democracy and democracy promotion uh, uh, globally. So thank you, Michael, uh, for joining us today. We're also joined by Scott Dowell uh, from CDC. Uh, he heads the, he's the director of the Division on Global Dise Disease Detection and Emergency Response within the Center on Global Health. He's an infectious disease expert. Uh, as a, uh, perfect for this setting here because he uh, going back to the early part of the naught decade, 2001 to 2005, was in Thailand working very closely and collaboratively with the Thai health officials in that period of SARS and H5N1 in putting together the proto-model of cooperation around uh, global disease and detection. What became our GDD, or our Global Disease and Detection Program, grew out of that leadership and that experimentation that Scott drove in that period. He's come back and subsequently built out that program. We now have 10 global disease and detection programs uh, with 10 partner countries around the world. He, all that program has also become a, a collaborating center with WHO and really a central element in moving forward international health regulation implementation worldwide. We're also very honored today to have Bernard Nalen, Nalen Dr. Uh, uh, Nalen is the deputy coordinator uh, uh, of the President's Malaria Initiative, which we all know is, is, is the premier vehicle since 2005 of the U.S. government in moving forward uh, uh, malaria control and eradication efforts worldwide. We've also been blessed by, um, dating back to the Bush administration and through the Obama administration, remarkable continuity of leadership of the PMI with Bernard and with his colleague Tim Ziemer, Admiral Ziemer, who heads that program up. It's a much admired uh, and much emulated program. Um, uh, Bernard is p a member of the U.S. Public Health Service, a uh, medical doctor, st uh, started his career at CDC in the, um, uh, in the programs there, spent seven years as part of the CDC Kemri program uh, in Kenya doing um, an, uh, some groundbreaking 
uh, field research on malaria in different dimensions of malaria, particularly with reference to pregnant women and children, and played a, a, a big role in the startup of the uh, rollback malaria program at WHO. Uh, we're also joined here, our, our fourth panelist is David Smith. Um, he is a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Force Health Protection and Readiness um, um, uh, at, at the Department of Defense, a graduate of the Northwest Medical School, Northwestern Medical School, served in very important positions on health at the Joint Staff as a Joint Staff Surgeon, as a medical, senior medical advisor in Afghanistan for a period. Uh, and so we have here, I think, just a remarkable collection of, of folks representing at the leadership level these four different institutions. So please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> well, what I suggest we do is just go sort of in quick sequence. I've asked Michael to, 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 to kick things off. Uh, speak for five to seven minutes, give us an overview of how the State Department is looking at these issues in this particular period. This is a big year in terms of the uh, uh, Secretary and the President's engagement going back last year, this coming year, and then what, what follows, and then, we will, and then we will move to our other speakers. So, Michael, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I wanted to thank CSIS and the authors of the report and Admiral uh, Fallon, General Peak, um, for leading this effort. I think this is an uh, incredibly important set of issues to focus on um, now uh, and in the coming years, especially. Um, in the last few years, I think that the rebalance has gotten a rap as a predominantly security um, focused uh, effort, um, and of course that is a central piece of what uh, the United States uh, aims to do in the region. Um, our long-term uh, alliances uh, providing the backbone, I think, for regional security. But it really is the overall goals of the rebalance really are in this space are in enhancing our engagement with the entire region in a wide set of issues from economics to human rights and democracy issues, uh, trade and investment, uh, deepening our partnerships with multilateral institutions. And so the focus here today on health issues and development issues across the board I think is a very, very important part and sometimes an overlooked part uh, of the discussion. Obviously, we, I think we've all heard the stories and all know it very well in recent decades, the dynamism and economic growth that we've seen across the Asia Pacific in recent decades um, from Japan, South Korea, uh, Singapore, so on. Uh, now we're seeing in places like China, India, and Indonesia. But I think that one thing that is also important to keep in mind and that is uh, raised by today's report is the fact that there are still millions and millions of people in the region who are living in poverty, um, who are facing significant day-to-day -day challenges, um, trying to provide for their families um, and societies, really trying and struggling with major development uh, challenges. And uh, a lot of that is in mainland Southeast Asia um, and in the Mekong uh, region. So why is this important to us that we focus on this particular set of issues, this aspect uh, of the rebalance. Um, I think that uh, uh, Admiral Fallon um, uh, hit the nail on the head when he said that this is a lot more than just really do-gooder stuff. Um, there's a moral responsibility, of course, um, but this is a security issue at the end of the day, um, I think. We all have a strong interest, obviously, in a peaceful and a prosperous, broader Asia-Pacific region, as President Obama and senior officials from the administration have announced time and time again. Um, and at the heart, I think, of this uh, investment in the region is an investment in Southeast Asia and where Southeast Asia is going. A strong, prosperous, peaceful, united uh, Southeast Asia um, and a united association of Southeast Asian nations, uh, ASEAN, um, uh, regional organization, which is a key regional organization. Um, that really sits at the center of a number of different things that are very important to the strategic rebalance and to what's happening right now in the broader Asia-Pacific region. And I think that uh, 
the investment that we're making right now in Southeast Asia, this is going to be a crucial part of it, uh, investing in the development um, and the economic growth across that region. Part of the challenge here, again, is actually a challenge that these nations themselves, of course, in the broader Southeast Asia region has established for itself. If you look at ASEAN right now, one of its main goals is bridging the development gap within ASEAN between much of the maritime states of Southeast Asia, which are predominantly better off uh, economically than those of mainland Southeast Asia. And this is really, a, again, a primary goal for ASEAN. And so I think that this is an effort, our investment in supporting uh, health care, health security, economic growth and development in mainland Southeast Asia is a part of a the much broader framework here. It's supporting ASEAN's development. It's supporting economic growth and trade across borders uh, in Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, and it's strengthening ASEAN politically, which is uh, very important to our longer-term strategic goals. ASEAN is now the driver of the region's multilateral institutions, the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, all of these uh, strategic uh, fora, which President Obama participates in, Secretary Kerry participates in, and leaders from across the rest of the region participate in, are driven by ASEAN. And so the stronger that ASEAN is, I think the better off uh, the region is going to be. And this is a key component, I think, of, st of strengthening uh, ASEAN and its ability for regional uh, leadership. I think the challenges here that we face in the Mekong region are, are stark. Uh, and significant, and many of them are outlined by the report here today. I think from energy shortages, major transnational health threats, of course, poverty, malnutrition, to name just a few. And one of the biggest problems that I think we face here is that the capacity of the countries of mainland Southeast Asia and the Mekong region is significantly underdeveloped. But again, as the report lays out here today, I think that there are significant opportunities that these countries have before them. Just look at some of the trends right now uh, in this region. ASEAN right now, again, is working to achieve its own stated goal of an economic community by the end of 2015, um, which is working furiously uh, to achieve. And they've set out some big and ambitious goals for them. It will benefit all the countries um, that we're talking about here today. Myanmar, of course, is emerging from decades uh, of stagnation and going on undergoing a historic political reform process that is having significant impacts in the economic and development space. Uh, I know we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, here today. Vietnam is looking to reform uh, its economy um, and parts of its society as part of the TPP <coughs> agreement. And of course, Cambodia and Laos, I think, are growing um, uh, at a significant clip in recent years um, and trying to create more widespread um, uh, benefits for their populations. And so I think if you look at all of these trends together, there are some real opportunities for us to take advantage of, I think, in supporting the goals um, that these countries have outlined uh, for themselves. Um, the report, again, I think was very, very uh, clear and was, again, hit the nail on the head, I think, in identifying some of the ele elements that we're going to need uh, in a successful approach um, here needs high-level leadership, uh, any effort that we undertake. It needs a core pot of funding, um, obviously, which is going to be crucial. Strong collaboration with and buy-in from partner governments, which, again, um, as uh, General Peak and Admiral Fallon are making clear, if you don't have this sort of relationship with the countries and the buy-in, we're not going to be able to achieve anything close to what we need to achieve. We need, of course, strong coordination within the United States government. Um, I think it's represented a little bit here today from the different agencies we have represented here. So I think it's a, it's a good sign. Um, and then, of course, we need strong uh, coordination with multilateral institutions uh, in the region, not just ASEAN, but many of the others that are investing uh, in the Mekong, from the ADB to the World Bank and so forth. So I thought I'd just spend just one minute very quickly um, before turning it over to uh, talking about an initiative that the United States uh, has started with some of the partner governments in the region that is a very good foundation, we believe, for some of these efforts uh, called the Lower Mekong uh, Initiative. Uh, mentioning some of the things that CSIS's report uh, highlighted here, I think they're going to be successful to an approach. We believe that the Lower Mekong Initiative actually has begun to lay the groundwork for some of these. Um, High-level political leadership, 
Secretary of State Secretary, uh, participates and leads uh, the initiative every year. Secretary Kerry was just in Brunei a few weeks ago um, hosting uh, his first Lower Mekong Initiative uh, ministerial with the uh, ministers from Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, and Myanmar. LMI has a whole of government approach, uh, including many different parts of the State Department, but also something uh, can, basically about more than 20 agencies across the U.S. government are involved uh, in LMI. Um, partner country buy-in as well in its first few years. We've done a significant amount of work to get support from the countries in the Mekong, investing in uh, the LMI framework. Um, and at the request of LMI countries, we've also broadened it to uh, include a second set of uh, meetings and fora called the Friends of the Lower Mekong, which brings in donor, major donor countries and multilateral organizations, everyone from Australia and Japan to the EU to the ADB and World Bank, together to help coordinate um, development approaches in the Mekong uh, region. LMI is focused mostly on capacity building. Um, and again, I think this does speak to something that Admiral Fallon was talking about uh, in his opening remarks, which is the need to invest for the longer term here in the region. The United States government, we have money, we have capabilities, we have expertise, and we can come in quickly and we can do a lot of things. But if we're going to make any real progress on this, uh, these set, this set of issues over the long term, we need to build capacity in partner governments. And that's where we believe that a small, a relatively small amount of investment through initiatives like Lower Mekong Initiative and issues like health, um, we can build up the capacity of ministries uh, and uh, others in these governments um, and in these countries um, to support longer term solutions uh, to these problems. So just to run quickly through, in the LMI health pillar, we have six pillars um, of different issues that we're working on. The health pillar is one of them, and I'd say probably the most advanced um, of uh, the pillars. We're working on everything from building capacity and coordination in response to diseases like malaria, TB, HIV, AIDS, working on preventing, controlling, counterfeit, and substandard medications, and supporting the implementation of the international health regulations. Now, LMI, again, is a relatively new effort, and like all things new, uh, and multilateral efforts especially, will take a significant amount of time to build. Um, but I think that over uh, the coming years, as we invest more into this and as partner countries invest more in this framework, there's a foundation here, I think, for all the work that we're going to be talking about um, here today. Uh, the one other thing I would like to mention before turning it over is that health security is, of course, a very crucial issue here, and I'm very happy that we're talking about that issue here today. But it's also directly linked to a range of other very important issues that I don't think we can overlook um, in the Mekong region. Uh, if you look at any other issue, connectivity and cross-border management issues, for instance, are key to preventing diseases from spreading across borders. Adequate food and water security are essential to address issues like mal malnutrition. And energy security is going to be essential for a wide variety of health-related issues, including ensuring governments have their ability to run hospitals, clinics, and medical services. And so that's why in the LMI framework, at least, we're focused on bringing all of these different aspects of the development and the growth agenda together um, so that all of them uh, can work uh, as a mutually reinforcing whole. Uh, finally, again, I would just like to reemphasize uh, how important it is that the U.S. government be working together. Uh, on this. Um, and again, and we'll discuss, I know, some of this here today, and I think that you've already seen some steps we've taken in recent years to enhance our ability to work together. Um, it, this was on display, I think, actually a few weeks ago, a very good example of this, the uh, ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, which is the ASEAN Group uh, plus eight other major regional uh, countries, including the United States, organized in Brunei, a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercise and military medicine joint exercise with representatives from the U.S. military who are working side by side um, with folks from all the other countries uh, in the region. I think it was a tremendous display of coordination and capacity building um, that I think we need to continue to invest uh, in efforts uh, like this. So anyway, to conclude, I think that Really, this is a very, very important discussion, and I would just say that uh, as we're talking about it here today and as you talk about it with colleagues and others um, going forward from today, I think obviously we just continue to need more uh, on these efforts, more of uh, a lot of different things, more foreign assistance funding, 
of course, I think is always uh, crucial uh, across the board, especially with the debates going on nowadays. I think this is a very, very important uh, issue. It shows that small investments can have uh, outsized impacts, I think, in terms of U.S. national security uh, and interests uh, across the world. And I think more support from not just the USG, but Congress, the private sector, NGOs, and others um, to have more conversations like this for what we can do working together to support um, this broader agenda. So with that, I'll over to you. Thanks. That's terrific, Michael. Uh, I'd like to ask Scott Dow from CDC to offer some remarks, and then I'll come to Bernard and then David. Thank you. In 2004, avian influenza was the health security threat of the Mekong Basin. It wasn't like that at first. Uh, initially, it was seen as an agricultural problem with economic consequences, and countries in the region down downplayed it. But I remember seeing on the cover of the Bangkok Post a picture of a, a small boy whose mother had taken him to a series of clinics and hospitals, and he had then died being undiagnosed with avian influenza. It outraged the Thai public, and it caught the attention of political leaders in Thailand, and avian influenza then became a priority for Thailand to respond to. I was called on a Thursday afternoon by Dr. Kumnuan, the head of the Bureau of Epidemiology. I was there at the time um, starting up an international emerging infections program, the precursor to the global disease detection program that Steve mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And we were there trying to develop these collaborations between CDC and the Ministry of Public Health on response to epidemics. Kamnoan was concerned because he had just confirmed a woman who died from avian influenza. And before dying, she mentioned to her nurse <clears throat> that her daughter also was sick a couple weeks earlier and had died from something similar. He was worried that she had gotten it from the daughter, which would have been unprecedented. And the reason was that she was living in Bangkok and had traveled up to Kampang Pet province where the girl was, had not visit, visited the village poultry, uh, but had just been at the girl's bedside. So in driving up there early the next morning, we, the story began to unfold and we scrambled uh, thinking that this might be the virus that starts the next pandemic and we needed to get samples of it. Uh, the daughter had been cremated, the mother's body was embalmed. And so it's a scramble to get that. And as we're going, we heard that the aunt was hospitalized also, also having spent time at the bedside of the girl. Uh, she was then in the hospital we were heading for. We arrived there, and they showed us the chest X-ray, which clearly had a lobar pneumonia. So we then had a potentially a third uh, patient and went to the room where the aunt was being kept and taught the healthcare workers about proper isolation and safely caring for her. Uh, got specimens to try and identify the virus and gave the ant uh, oseltamivir treatment. With us were veterinary epidemiologists who'd come up because of the need to look at the chickens and poultry in the village. And so much of the afternoon was spent in the village looking at the history of the poultry die-offs in that village and assessing who was exposed uh, to the girl, to the poultry, and giving out uh, prophylaxis as needed. Now, ultimately, it turned out that that was not the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, it was one of the first and better described clusters of human-to-human -human transmission. That part was confirmed. Um, and it served as a model in subsequent years for responses in Thailand and other countries around the world to H5N1 clusters. Uh, that early detection, that quick response, the multidisciplinary team going out and, and with veterinarians, communications, and other staff. Uh, the ability to give uh, treatment, quarantine, prophylaxis as needed to try and contain the spread of the epidemic before it, it, it moved further. All of those became elements of what's been done with H5N1 since then. In the aftermath of that, as Thailand controlled their H5N1, I was invited to the office of the Prime Minister of Thailand uh, to uh, receive a, a recognition for, as a representative of CDC and the U.S. government for our contributions to Thailand's uh, control. And in a somewhat bizarre little ceremony, I was presented with a large basket of Thai poultry products. <laughs> uh, 
uh, which we ate, and uh, was they, were, they were very good. <laughs> I, I tell you this story for, for three reasons. One, uh, to reiterate the point that these health issues are important priorities in the Mekong Basin countries. Second, that U.S. government collaborations can be critical, especially if we build those relationships ahead of time that can serve us in a time of crisis. And third, that the collaborations from our government to host governments are highly valued. Uh, really, there's almost nothing else that we can do that's more valued or more consistently valued than helping countries at a time of a public health crisis to respond adequately to that crisis. So currently, where are we? we I think we have a unique window of opportunity, as the report po points out. Um, there is a stuttering progress towards implementation of the international health regulations to which all countries in the region have agreed and that, that may, most of them are waiting for help to make progress on. We also have some new technologies in the area of informatics and in the area of laboratories that allow us to detect earlier than ever before and respond more effectively than ever before. And finally, right now, there is concern in the region and here about the MERS coronavirus, about falciparum malaria resistant to artemisinins, about H7N9 influenza, and those come together uh, to make it a very good time to talk about these issues. As many of you may know, Secretary Sebelius took a trip to the region just last month and with uh, Director Frieden from CDC visited a uh, poultry market in, in Vietnam and highlighted some of the progress that has been made since 2004, but also some of the, the needs that are, are, are still there. So what needs to happen? It's not complicated. Three things, detect these problems as early as possible, respond effectively, and prevent the ones that are possible. I'd highlight just two quick things under detect early. All countries in the Mekong Basin ought to have nationwide laboratory systems that are able to characterize influenza and resistant malaria and the full range of pathogens that can cause these epidemics. And second, they ought to have trained field epidemiologists in adequate numbers to do these field investigations and to get on top of the small epidemics before they become big ones. In the area of response, all countries should have an emergency operations center that's equipped and staffed and able to stand up an emergency response within 120 minutes of a public health emergency declaration. And secondly, they ought to have rapid response teams so modeled on the ones that I described for Thailand, and Thailand has done a lot of good work in this area, that have veterinary epidemiologists, human disease experts, communications folks, and so forth that can go out and respond early. And then third, I mentioned prevention. Um, it is possible to prevent some of these uh, epidemics. Uh, in antimicrobial resistance in particular, and focusing on artemisin and resistant malaria, um, it is possible to track that much better than we have and to stay on top of it by providing early combination therapy. Um, and then laboratory, biosafety and biosecurity, a simple but effective preventive measures. Labs across the region ought to have biosafety and biosecurity programs to prevent the kind of outbreaks we saw after SARS where on several occasions in that region, SARS broke out even after it was controlled worldwide. The cost and result of this, pretty minimal. As the, as the report points out, a minimal investment of between one and two billion dollars would be enough to ensure this kind of progress throughout the region. And we could see in the region and worldwide a situation where we all are safer because epidemics are detected early re and responded to effectively. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Scott. Bernard. Thanks, Steve, and again, congratulations to the team that put this timely report together. Um, it's, I think the issue of focusing on health is, a, is appropriate as a first step in this. Um, it's clear that U.S. government's efforts in global health have been one of the most cost-effective soft power tools we have, um, not only to benefit the people that are being served by these efforts, but also to assure our own nation's uh, continuing prosperity and perpetuity. Um, it's a 
like one of the best demonstrations, I think, of American values. And moreover, frankly, it's uh, saving the lives of uh, tens of thousands of um, men, women, and children around the world as, we, as we're sitting here. The U.S. government's investment in the, uh, the Mekong region in the health sector, on the one hand, is not new. So um, I think what's going on presently, if there's any rebalancing, is actually doing more and doing it better. For example, the issue of uh, um, the emergence of Artemis resistant malaria was uh, first recognized by U.S. government investments through the USAID regional office in Bangkok, um, working with uh, the Armed Forces uh, Institute of Medical Research that many of you are familiar with and other research institutes in the region to set up a, a multi-country surveillance system, similar to what Scott is, uh, had set up for other emerging pandemic threats, specifically to look at um, the challenge of this, this region is notorious, particularly Western Cambodia, is notorious in the world of malaria for having some of the uh, most clever and meanest falciparum parasites out there um, to the point that any drug that's been thrown at them in the past, eventually there's been resistance that's developed. Um, the artemisinin um, class of drugs, many of you are familiar with, were um, frankly uh, first developed by China. Um, and are the most effective drugs we have at this point in time to rapidly clear parasitemia and save lives. The fact that now parasites have uh, emerged in this region that are resistant to artemisinins is indeed uh, an urgent emergency, not only for that region, but frankly for the whole world. I mean, if you look at what happened, for example, with the emergence of chloroquine resistance um, back in the 1970s in the same area of the Mekong region, Chloroquine resistance was introduced into Africa, and the seven years I was out in Western Kenya, you could see the devastation of that cause because on a daily basis in these hospitals, you could see kids dying from malaria, which was not being treated with effective drugs at that point in time because chloroquine no longer worked. All the countries in Africa now and, and in the Americas have now moved to these artemisinin-based combination therapies. So if indeed Ar artemisinin resistance is not I don't want to use the term contained, we need to get rid of it in the Mekong region, there will be um, a similar sort of level of devastation if this were to show up in these high transmission areas of Africa. So that's why I think the, the report appropriately has this as one of the major things to focus on. When the President's Malaria Initiative was first launched in 2005, and many of you are familiar with it's an initiative led by USAID and implemented together um, in 19 high burden countries in Africa, um, the Mekong itself was not, quote unquote, didn't have a PMI fingerprint. Um, so even though USAID um, was working with CDC and others in the region like set, to set up the surveillance uh, to, which eventually detected Artemis and resistance, it's only when that actually came to the fore that we decided it was time to uh, put more resources into this area. Um, and that's where we are today. I was just at a meeting uh, week before last in Phnom Penh, where the Global Fund is now putting an additional $100 million um, on top of their in-country grants that they already have existing in Myanmar and Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos, putting additional money in to try to address this problem. I think this problem has uh, some of the, the major factors that um, Michael and Scott and others have already referred to. First of all, there is a high level of um, political leadership. There are resources on the table. Um, there is a buy-in from the countries because the countries themselves have, first of all, the, the good thing is in this region, the countries have had some pretty remarkable progress over the past 10 or 15 years of driving down malaria transmission. I mean, case burdens have decreased by like 80% in most of these countries. Of course, Myanmar is, uh, is the country where um, having been cut off for so long from the sort of technical assistance and resources that are needed to address this problem, um, have a, a longer way to go. So I'll just stop there. There's a, the, the fact is that Artemis resistance is a global public health emergency at this point in time. And we need to do something about it because frankly, there are no other drugs in the pipeline at the moment that will be available within the next five or 10 years. Um, so, and also referring um, to what Michael Fuchs said, 
the U.S. government, I mean, these health issues are, of course, linked to food security, to the environmental um, changes that are going on in the region. Um, and USAID and others have, uh, have programs in these other areas as well. Um, one of the challenges from the health perspective, I'm sure it's probably similar to uh, avian flu. I know it's certainly similar with uh, tuberculosis and what's going on there, are these mobile populations and how best we can reach them. And the mobile populations uh, are not only um, those crossing borders to work in the agriculture and fishing sector, but also the military. I mean, the military are deployed in these border areas where Artemis resistance has emerged. So at the recent meeting in Bangkok, there was actually a representative from PACOM there um, as a follow-up to the meeting which took place, and some discussion now of having a joint military-civilian meeting as a follow-up to that sometime later in the year. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bernard. David, thank you. Well, good afternoon, and um, I also would like to thank uh, particularly Steve and Chris for inviting me to participate in the panel. And um, I always enjoy these uh, thoughtful conversations and what's brought forth in these forums. And I also would like to congratulate the task force leaders for the uh, uh, raising these issues as the other uh, panelists have acknowledged. So I think we all know that global health activities are critical to building a country's health capa capabilities and are essential to infrastructure. And DOD generally engages uh, in these activities on primarily a mil uh, military to military basis, um, and in some cases, military to civilian basis to teach and learn lessons in public health, sanitation, trauma care, logistics, disease surveillance, and disaster preparedness and response primarily. And this helps prevent uh, the spread of disease and illness. It will ideally create healthier populations and increase local preparedness. And I think as has already been mentioned, uh, this can lead to more stable nations advancing our national uh, security objectives. However, when the U.S. military does uh, act, we're generally doing it in a supporting role, not alone, and we um, are generally doing it with our U.S. government, par government partners, as has been noted, uh, from HHS, from USAID, and Department of State primarily, to accomplish these missions. And the collaboration is key to ensuring our missions meet the needs of both the host country and USG objectives. So the Department of Defense has a significant interest in the Mekong region, as you might expect, because of its strategic importance in the Asia-Pacific theater, as has already been noted. We're investing in the Mekong region to help build health capacity of the host nations in areas of vector-borne illness, drug-resistant infections, surveillance capabilities, and novel respiratory illness. And the department has a robust global health surveillance capabilities that we can leverage to monitor uh, disease and pandemic outbreaks as I think you're aware, in partnership with some of our other uh, USG partners. And our labs that are relevant to the discussion are primarily in Thailand and Pacific, in, and in the Pacific, as it has already been noted. And these, in combination with the other labs, uh, we partner with host nations to develop skills and capabilities to research, detect, and prevent the spread of hazards common to each of these regions. And just to highlight the two in the area, the U.S. Naval Medical Research Unit 2, NAMRU 2 as we call it, uh, evaluates new preventive measures and treatments focused on malaria, dengue, influenza, infectious diarrhea, and emerging infection, infectious diseases. And they're headquartered in Hawaii, but have field activities in Cam Cambodia, Singapore, Laos, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And the lab's U.S. and international military and public health personnel all collaborate on research and surveillance that enhance local capacity to address infectious diseases and, of course, advance global knowledge. The other facility that's been referred to is the Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences, or AFIRM, and it's run by the U.S. Army in Bangkok, and it unites the DOD, the U.S. Public Health Service, the Thai military, and civilian medical researchers to collaborate on developing affordable products that rapidly detect, prevent, and treat illness common to the region. And it's been noted, uh, the lab has made important breakthroughs such as the <coughs> hepatitis A vaccine, the Japanese encephalitis vaccine, and the first HIV vaccine that General Peak referred to earlier that has been shown to have efficacy in human clinical trials. 
and it's now a key participant in a number of trials um, on the Thai Burma border looking at the, uh, the malaria resistance. Another example of our efforts in the area, uh, the Pacific Command, PACOM, has facilitated over 20 contingency preparedness engagements in the Asia Pacific partners in recent years, providing training to over 7,000 disaster preparedness practitioners in the region to help our military partners and host nations develop capacity and capability to respond to health crises. These growing collective health theater security cooperation activities emphasize the and interagency approach that builds both host nations capability, interoperability, and crisis response capability and resilience. And as I, noticed, as I noted, the global health activities are an important part of our engagement around the globe. And because of that, we we've we've, have recently established a global health working group to think through the roles and responsibilities that DOD does play in global health. And this group has been assessing the manpower needed for these missions. As you can imagine, we have a, a large resource pool with lots of talent, but actually keeping track of that and figuring out uh, uh, putting the right people in the right seats is part of the issue. And then also making sure that we have the most effective training to be effective in the field. And the group is also looking at measures of effectiveness of our global health activities, as you can imagine, particularly in, um, as the financial um, constraints get tighter, that becomes more and more important to be able to actually judge the effectiveness of what we're actually doing. And these findings clearly will be rolled into our uh, planning and policy at the department and may have applicability to others. So in summary, uh, the U.S. military has been active in global health activities for a very long time, and we will continue to participate in those global <coughs> health activities that strengthen our partnerships. The Mekong region is important to the department and we will continue our partnerships with the host nations in the area. So I thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you all. Um, we're gonna move into our discussion period. I'd like to ask uh, Admiral Tom Cullison to kick things off with, uh, with an initial question to our, uh, to our panelists and we'll come back to them and then we'll, in this next round, open it, all, open it up to all of you, Tom. Steve, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to all the panelists for your, for your very cogent remarks. I, I guess the, where I would like to take this is to um, kind of expand a little bit beyond the, the comments that have been made uh, about working together. And there, was many, there were many comments about national leadership, both within the United States and other countries, common problems. There were lots of discussions about particularly the U.S. overseas military labs working together with our colleagues from CDC and other infectious disease agencies. Uh, there were also comments about the episodic nature of particularly DOD health engagement with the hospital ships going overseas and, uh, and the episodic nature of military to military engagement. So if we are going to, uh, as a nation, as the United States, uh, support our national interests and our national strategies through health, uh, using a whole of government approach and if we're going to work with our, our partners both within the United States and the international agencies and the countries with which we're going to work, how do we go about this? Uh, my observation over the last several years is that within the United States we seem to be coming close together, closer together and the fact that we have you four on this panel speaks to that and the fact that the papers that Steve has uh, led from CSIS has been talking about this topic uh, as we go. My question particularly to Dr. Smith would be within DOD you mentioned the Global Health Working Group is should it be a role for the Department of Defense to have personnel whose main job or a major part of their job is to be focused in this area and to uh, Admiral Dowell how do you work with DOD with CDC on these uh, on these topics and for Michael Fuchs how does State Department include this in the goals that you have for our nation that, that the State Department leads, and for Bernard, as a non-DOD, non-State Department agency that works with USAID, how do, you, how do you get involved in this? How do we proceed as a government? Uh, I see the glass is half full, so I'd like to know how to fill it up completely. Thanks, Tom. Uh, should we start with Dave? I think that you were the first designated uh, target there for that question. Um, so my question was whether or not we should have folks that are dedicated to this, uh, this effort. And I think the, uh, my personal opinion is clearly yes. 
We have a group now that's looking at this issue. I suspect what's going to happen is, is that we're going to have a trained cadre that hopefully a small group that can do this for an entire career and gradually develop that, that expertise and capability. But we're going to have others that are going to go in and out um, of, the, of this area and take that uh, knowledge to other aspects of our mission. Uh, we presently now have been setting up and are cataloging all of the opportunities that we have in the area. We have liaisons at a number of different uh, USG um, organizations now, uh, which I think are uh, clearly contributing to that knowledge base. And um, actually the chair of our task force that's looking at this issue is in the audience and they are in the process of, of cataloging what's available both within the DOD and then what we can leverage from academia and other places. One other, how do we liaison within the USG? One of the opportunities is my boss and the, the health leads in each one in um, state, in HHS, and in uh, USAID uh, meet on a quarterly basis to discuss common issues and how can we uh, better collaborate, where are, where are there crossed wires and various, um, and they can be very active, interesting uh, discussions when we uh, do actually meet. So that's one of the ways that we try to facilitate communication between the various uh, departments. Scott? Yeah, I would tend to agree with observation that things have improved. I think the communication is good and the relationships are cordial back at headquarters and if, if you look in the field, even more so. The uh, communication is good across uh, the different agencies, military to civilian and so forth. Um, now having said that, everybody has their day jobs and when the communication ends, people tend to go back to their day jobs. And I wouldn't say that we have worked as effectively as either U.S. government or as an international community at some of the things that we're, we should be doing. And uh, the implementation of the international health regulations is a case in point. They're, as I said, they're falling behind. Things aren't getting done. So if you're asking the question is, could we do even better at collaboration if there was a coherent U.S. government plan and there was a, a, a series of country plans that people bought into and really pushed to get uh, implemented, I think there is the possibility for even better work. Michael? Well, I would uh, echo uh, your comment and Scott's about uh, the fact that U.S. government coordination, I think, is improving. Um, again, I can speak from a uh, State Department perspective and with the experience of the Lower Mekong Initiative, I think in particular that has happened in, in the health pillar alone in the Lower Mekong Initiative. Um, we have representatives from multiple different agencies, including DOD, um, participating uh, in that on a regular basis. But the one thing that I would say, um, in addition to, of course, better coordination within the U.S. government that we really need is partner country coordination. Um, of course with us, but with one another, really. Um, and it's part of the reason, again, why LMI is one framework, again, uh, has been one of our goals within LMI, is to get the countries of the Mekong actually working with one another. I mean, especially in the health area, but across all these areas, as we know, these are transnational issues. And underdevelopment in the rural areas, especially there, is very, makes it very difficult. Um, to coordinate responses and lack of capacity uh, even more so. And so just getting the right people from these partner countries in the rooms, on the right places, in the right times, having the right conversations is incredibly important. Um, and no matter how coordinated we are here, I don't think that we're going to achieve very much if they're not uh, as coordinated as we are. Um, so that's at least where we're putting some of our efforts now. Bernard? Yeah, so I can only speak at it from the malaria perspective, which is where I spent most of my career. And uh, I, frankly, even going back to my days in Kenya, where as the CDC director, a large part of the uh, funding for the studies we were doing actually came for, through USAID. Um, and we had a great relationship with the USAID country office there. So I was a little surprised, frankly, when I um, left that environment to hear that there were real problems in some countries with, uh, with not as a effective collaboration with the, some of these major agencies. So I, I guess I was a little protected and naive at that point in time. I think, um, you know, I wasn't around when PMI was set up, but I think some of the lessons we learned from other sorts of initiatives that maybe got off to a rockier start. Um, I came about a year and a half after it was set up. Again, the decision had been made to have this 
hosted, led by USAID with CDC as the main um, implementing partner with USAID, and we have an interagency advisory group which includes NIH and DOD and others. I think that, if you just look at what happened, that actually made quite a bit of sense because it didn't require PMI then to set up new country offices and do, because it's basically part of the USAID health team reporting to the USAID mission director to the ambassador, and sometimes the ambassadors do get involved with assisting us when we have things that are stuck. Um, it is really, like most things, about people, too, and I think there's some advantages, frankly, to encouraging people to move between agencies and have some cross-fertilization because you do um, see things from uh, both the strengths and, and weaknesses from different perspectives once you've had that opportunity to do so. Lastly, from a PMI perspective, we put a lot of uh, time and effort on supporting the national malaria control programs, um, updating their national malaria control plans when there's new technical issues or the, like the emergence of, I mean, the, the new tools, for example, rapid diagnostic tests, uh, some of the new recommendations from WHO, how do you implement those? And we actually won't fund anything that's not part of the national malaria control plan and which isn't a priority for the government. So that brings in the issue of the military now where we're trying to encourage the civilian and military to um, have these sorts of discussions so that the needs of the military populations are actually included in the national air control plans. I think there does need to be, it is, you know, having lots of different plans and people different agendas becomes very problematic at a country and at least from our perspective the way to do that is to have a technically sound robust national air control plan which is updated as needed. Thank you. Um, why don't we open things up, and I'd like to uh, invite you all to uh, offer some uh, quick comments, questions. Please keep them succinct. Please identify yourself. Just put your hand up, and um, one of our folks will come forward with, with a microphone. We have someone here. We'll, do three or four, we'll take three or four comments and questions, so please those of you who do want to jump in, also put your put your hands up. Yes. Hi, my name is Morgan Wolf, um, and I will be a rising senior at Northwestern this year. And I was wondering, is there things that people in my position, people who will recent or who recently graduated, her who will be graduates soon, is there anything that we can do immediately to leverage our position and? jump into this movement to help forward it or to help continue it when we get to um, a different place, I guess. Thank you. Do we have other comments or questions here? The gentleman there. Thank you, uh, respected all speaker. Uh, I am Ron from Cambodia. I am appreciate uh, your uh, comments on the Mekong uh, uh, Rivers project, and I appreciate uh, your project what we call human uh, uh, security. That is a new term that I, uh, we just, uh, I think uh, we had just heard a few uh, decades or something like that. And uh, I, co I completely agree, sorry about my English maybe. I complete agree, uh, completely agree with uh, you that you, uh, the US right now put uh, forward its foreign policy of uh, smart or slash soft power to the region Southeast Asia. And you, as you see that Southeast Asia is an emerging uh, region compared to other regions. And of course, ASEAN is a, a diversification of our society, uh, especially in terms of uh, development and economic growth. As you mentioned, uh, we have Cambodian, Laos, and Myanmar. Uh, Vietnam is the less uh, developing country compared to the other ASEAN country. And uh, I. I support, of course, your project right now, what we call human security. Uh, you, uh, health security is, uh, is functioning right now on the right track in the region. But I can tell you that uh, uh, how, uh, how I can see that uh, the China probably uh, see that you are not uh, trying to put uh, the interest not only in the sea-based interest, but right now you come also to the river-based power. I don't know what are you thinking about. The, from my point of view, I can see China can tell you that you are now not only interested in the sea-based power in the Chao China Sea and now coming to the river-based power in the, in the region. That is the point that I just would like to have a note uh, from you. You will be 
encounter with this uh, with the China emerging in the Mekong region because China is the you know the, the Mekong region is the China Mek, uh, Mekong River is the China uh, rivers because it's from China originally yeah and we call that we are in the lower Mekong uh, River right now so I would like to uh, to uh, have some common say that China is ahead from uh, U.S. compared to uh, right now. I don't know how, how many steps you are behind China. China was uh, with in the region uh, for many years. And uh, if you look back to the history, also China involved much in the region. And uh, China input their investment a lot on physical infrastructure in, in the regions. And you are not right now, uh, you can see uh, what we call health security. China may thinking, wow, you bring both health and military to the region. What China is going to do to counter with you in the future? And I think China can see the, your point of view on that, I think. And uh, if you would like to catch up China, I would like to suggest you also put investment on infrastructure. Let's say build road, build a bridge, build irrigation, build hydropower in the region because uh, we are desperate to, to need all this uh, you know, uh, investment to the country or to the region. China right now build more than 1,000 uh, roads in Cambodia on small loan. And U.S. just only build 200 roads in Cambodia. And the road, it of the, the road that was built by the U.S. since 1950. So, and since that, the U.S. never uh, focus on build our build the road or build uh, physical infrastructure in the in Cambodia. And uh, thank you. And that, that's my my comment. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Very powerful question. Set of comments. Can we can we get any other uh, any other comments in front here and in back? We'll take two more and then we'll come back to our we'll come back to our panelists. Please identify yourself. And Thank you. My name is Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Um, I just want to talk about the role of Vietnamese Americans. For years now, many of us have come back to Vietnam as NGO, and we've done many medical mission uh, short trips, which sometimes we do it on our own. We raise our own funds, and we gather our own capacity and put in medicine and things, and our own doctors come back and treat the the people in Vietnam, is there a way that we can collaborate and be part of the proposal program moving forward? And also recently, there's, a, um, um, there's an effort to treat hepatitis B and hepatitis as a whole in Vietnam. And just recently, there are many newborn babies uh, being vaccinated and died immediately. So is there a way that we can look into it hmm. and help to build up that capacity and prevent such um, Thank you. disasters? Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Chambers with the Air Force International Health Specialist Program. I have a comment and a question specifically for <coughs> Dr. Smith primarily. Um, and speaking in terms of health capacity development and mill-to-mill -mill engagement, uh, specifically looking at Burma, that's a very appealing situation in as much as over the last two to three decades, many of the health infrastructure um, commodities and resources have been siphoned or funneled away from civilian populace to the military and largely resides now within a, a military infrastructure. But as the Department of Defense has several proposals potentially to launch and engage with the Burmese, obviously there's some significant diplomatic issues as there's ongoing pro uh, progress in democracy, but still some uh, human rights issues, specifically in Arakan, Rakhine provinces. I'd like to ask your opinion, sir, on any hurdles uh, the DOD could anticipate in engaging in step with the Department of State as we approach Myanmar and working to improve both their military and civilian uh, health capacity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have, uh, from Morgan, we have the question around how do young graduates, uh, folks entering this field, contribute? Um, uh, from the scholar from Bard, the question around China, river-based power, which is a great phrase. 
and the question around um, how do we counter that from Jeannie around collaborating with uh, groups like your own that are already active, and the Lieutenant Colonel around Myanmar and the special sensitivities that are surrounding expanding the mill to mill. We've heard from Bernard about how the militaries within the region remain absolutely essential to any kind of effective response on the Artemis and resistant malaria, and the question is how do you begin to sync up with them. Maybe I could ask that many of those to move towards the China, certainly, and the mill to mills head towards the, 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 the larger diplomatic and political issues. So why don't I start with Michael, and then uh, we, can, we can move to our other panelists, and they can also, to the degree any of you can, talk about the, the question that Morgan raised around advice to this generation that are interested in these issues and how to see the future. Thank you. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start with a response to uh, one of the questions in particular from our uh, um, gentleman from Cambodia. Um, I, China obviously plays a tremendous role um, and has for a very long time and will continue to play a, a, a probably increasing role uh, in the region. And um, I think that where we see it as a, hopefully a collaborative uh, effort or complementary um, effort over the long run. And we have ongoing conversations with the Chinese about how to cooperate on issues, on development issues across the board, and even specifically on uh, how to cooperate, if there's the possibility to cooperate on health issues in particular um, in uh, the lower Mekong uh, region. So uh, we, our goal is very much to have uh, a uh, collaborative partnership um, relationship uh, with China in the region. And to your point about um, specifically infrastructure um, in the region, uh, that's obviously where a lot of uh, Chinese uh, funding um, goes. For the United States, obviously we have programs from USAID and some of the other agencies as well that are focused on some of the things that you were talking about here, um, whether it's irrigation uh, and other relate food security related issues. Um, there are some infrastructure type projects going on in the region, but they're more focused on capacity building and responding to requests from uh, the lower Mekong countries. And again, it's uh, the framework of the Lower Mekong Initiative, but more broadly from some of our efforts um, is to provide the assistance where requested um, and where we think our value added is. And it's in uh, sharing expertise uh, and experience um, in a number of these different areas. Uh, one program that we started recently uh, is actually providing technical assistance on infrastructure uh, projects in the Lower Mekong, um, such as um, dams uh, and related uh, areas, to requests that are made from countries in the Lower Mekong, providing them technical assistance when they're developing their plans and designs um, for those sorts of infrastructure projects. Um, but more broadly, again, I think it's sort of this software building um, side of things uh, is where we're spending uh, a lot of our time uh, and effort. And I think where we have a significant value add, and you see from the expertise across this table, um, here, but again, it's done very much in, a, in the hopes of a collaborative and complementary effort um, with other donors as well. China is a huge one, but again, as I mentioned, there are a tremendous number of other uh, outside donors um, from the multilateral development banks to Japan and uh, the EU, Australia, and others, and I think it's working together with all of them um, that's going to be very, very important over the long term, but I'll open up to others as well. Scott? Yeah, word about China. Um, <clears throat> about five years ago, Ch China asked us for help, technical help, with a problem they had with enterovirus 71. It was a rare, it's a virus that can attack young children and cause uh, widespread outbreaks and occasionally severe illness and death. They wanted uh, our technical assistance in the laboratory area and the epidemiology area, which we provided. Last year, Cambodia had a big epidemic of enterovirus 71 and asked for our assistance as well. And uh, in the course of responding, we found not only did we have a team responding to help Cambodia, but China also had a team bringing laboratory and epidemiological expertise to Cambodia, some of which we had taught them just a few years earlier. This month, or last month, within the last month or so, uh, there was an article published on the first trial of an enterovirus 71 vaccine 
from China, not from the U.S. So not only did they learn from our technical assistance and provide it to Cambodia, but they are now ahead of us in developing an EV-71 vaccine. So if the aim is to keep the U.S. out in front and uh, the situation the same as it was 10 years ago, we've lost. If the aim is to have a secure and more safe uh, region, it's all good. The Chinese assistance in Enervirus 71 to Cambodia adds to our assistance and makes the whole region safer and therefore us safer. But we shouldn't forget the lesson. What I said in my opening remarks was there's very little we can do that's more effective at building diplomatic relationships than helping countries when they're in a crisis. And that lesson is not lost on the Chinese. Um, so it, it, it behooves our country to keep that in mind, too. Others are learning those lessons, and we need to make sure that we stay out in front also with that kind of assistance. And I don't know if uh, Commander Gust Gustafsson or, uh, <laughs> or Mary Ann can help me out with the Miramar question, but in general, um, uh, clearly, there we are working closely with state. PACOM has a number of medical initiatives specifically that they want to address. There, um, we we do the technical piece, and then a policy works with state for the where and when. And frankly, I don't know where we are yet on that. And I don't know if you guys are prepared to say something quickly or not. and then we'll come back on these questions. Quick comment, please. Uh, yes, my name is Laura Fogable from the Office of Global Health in the Department of State, and I just wanted to follow up a little bit about working together. Um, in the case of Myanmar, I'm sure we're going to run into some observative capacity questions, and that's where the interagency close dialogue that happens at many different levels is very useful. And for example, I just wanted to note that CDC runs these excellent field epidemiological lab training programs, and when Laos found that it didn't have the ability to afford to send its health workers through a two-year training program, there was a discussion, um, and um, CDC was flexible enough to change its two-year program to a one-year program. It wasn't ideal in terms of the uh, training that you want to have people absorb, but it shows that when uh, the agencies come together, we can figure that out. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Thu. I'm from Vietnam. And um, I'm very uh, honored to be here today to listen to the talks, uh, the roundtable talks on about the health support to GMS region, including Vietnam. And being a, a Vietnamese person, I uh, highly appreciate the support of uh, uh, United States in through the Mercy Hospital ships in my countries and also the uh, building capacity for health worker in my city especially. Ten years ago my uh, father-in-law went to United States to take that for a six-month course of improving the capacity and um, also uh, I highly appreciate the American support in uh, the program of uh, diocesan clearance in landmark clearance, diocesan clearance in my cities in Da Nang City in the center of Vietnam, and uh, I have on questions: Is that uh, feasible and possible for United States government to push forward strongly forward the support to um, like um, the war victim the the yeah, to resolve the um, like landmine clearance and also the victims of diocese in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Because you see, 
in some uh, province in Vietnam, we lost the children, many children, every day due to the lead mine. Yes, so just my questions. Thank you. But did you have a chance to complete your thought on, at that point? Had any to these issues? Uh, well, just going back to uh, Megan Wolf, uh, her question about what can someone just leaving college do to get involved. Um, I actually find it pretty remarkable when you go on college campuses these days. I mean, it's been a while since I was a, a student, but um, the sort of level of interest and enthusiasm in global health issues and the fact that many universities now have global health programs that students can, I, I find pretty remarkable. Um, I don't think there's any one way to answer your question. I think people come out from different ways. Uh, at USAID, I'm probably the only, myself and Admiral Zimmer are the only non-Peace Corps volunteers. <laughs> Um, but there's a, that, that's one way some people get involved is spending some time in a country through Peace Corps or working with an NGO um, to get some direct hands-on experience and that then helps people decide what they want to do next. Do they want to go become a clinician? Do they want to do public health? Do they want to get involved in other sorts of issues? So um, I do think it's important um, from a malaria perspective. I, I continue to be surprised and, and um, and thrilled that the American people, the taxpayers in Congress, continue to put money towards something as important as malaria, because frankly, most people in the U.S. are not threatened by malaria, and as opposed to some of the other diseases we're talking about. So I think the sort of advocacy that's taking place in college campuses and through other things like, uh, I don't even have a TV, but um, the, um, what's this, the, the singing, American Idol, that's it. You know, they actually had it. <laughs> I've heard of it. Um, I see most of my TV on airplanes and they don't show American Idol. Um, but I mean, even things like American Idol having a malaria focus and stuff, that sort of advocacy at the college campus is very important. That's something you can do now. Um, and again, going back to the question about NGOs, um, NGOs in the Mekong and actually in every country where we work are one of the main implementing partners, but as I said, the way we fund is actually through the National Malaria Control Program. So an NGO working in malaria um, should be at the table with that and, and part of that plan as an implementing partner. Michael, did you want to say anything about the issues raised with regard to the dioxins yeah. and, and missing? I would just note very briefly on that. Uh, thank you for the question. And it's a very, very obviously important question, a very important issue. And it's something that the United States uh, has been working on for a number of years now um, and is continuing to work on um, uh, unexploded ordnance, landmine um, removal, uh, dioxin remediation as well. Um, I think it's a key piece, obviously, of uh, the partnership um, uh, and commitment uh, the United States has uh, to our relationship with Vietnam. I think you saw some of this, some of the discussions that happened when uh, President Song was here uh, last week um, meeting with, uh, with President Obama. And so anyway, I just say that our commitment sort of uh, is ongoing um, on that, so. Thank you. Um, on the question around universities, there, um, of course, Northwestern has a long tradition, is, is one of the most distinguished campuses with respect to Africa going back 60 years and has been very strong on, on the global health. There is a consortium of universities of global health. It was founded a few years ago, which brings together some 70 American campuses and almost 30 non-US based or non-North American uh, universities and has a large annual event. It was here in Washington back in March. There were almost 1,400 people participating in that, and we've played a strong role in helping them get started three, four years back and participating uh, with them. I think there is, as Bernard said, there's a very strong upsurge of interest among uh, faculty and students, and the big question it raises, raises is the career connection. Like, how do those people find meaningful and gainful employment as they go forward? And I think we're learning as we go forward about where those jobs, and those, I think many of the job applications are actually turning out to be in some of the traditional areas. A lot of pre-med students are coming to us with global health majors, and then they, they go into their medical training with a much broader outlook the, than earlier students, and others are going into, into um, other lines of work. And um, I think this is all very promising and very interesting, 
we published a piece by Mike Merson from Duke University back in 2010. If you go to our website, smartglobalhealth.org, you'll see a piece by Mike Merson that tries to analyze the root causes of this explosion of interest on American campuses. What are the root causes and where is it going and what does it mean in terms of the emergence of a very important constituency within American society now with respect to global health. Um, we have time for a couple of final closing questions and comments. Please be very brief. We'll start with the gentleman in the front here and the, and the woman uh, next. Yes. Hi. Um I'm Jeff Gren. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce. I direct the Office of Health and Consumer Goods. And I just want to mention a project that we're involved in, which I think hits a lot of the buttons mentioned. And this relates to medical devices, regulatory harmonization, and we are working with USAID, at, uh, industry, there's also commerce funding. We've been doing this for a while, but it's Ajian-wide training in implementing a common medical devices directive for the region. And we're doing a pilot program which included a AGNY training program and uh, in-country training uh, coming up last two weeks in August in Thailand and Indonesia, working with both um, ASEAN regulators and industry. And the Thailand program, we're inviting reps from Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos, and we also have a program coming up in Vietnam. The dates are not yet set, but it will likely be October. And, you know, I, along some of the comments that uh, people made today, it's really important to work with the regulators in the region, the industry in the region, and also under AGEON, there's a uh, ACCSQ, a series of industry-focused uh, working groups, and we're working with the medical devices working group. Thank you. Thank you. One issue that we flagged within this report, which grew out of a larger IOM study, Institute of Medicine study, is just how important fake and substandard drugs are as a problem within Southeast Asia, and particularly when you start looking at the resistance issue. And, um, and, and this is something that it's very difficult to begin to get your arms around, but there's been some progress, the IOM study being one of the most recent, but recent uh, 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 efforts that have tried to fill in our understanding. Ma'am? Hi, um, my name is Anissa Akbar Okta, um, and I just have a question um, regarding um, female engagement teams. Um, working in conflict situations uh, to collect um, intelligence, whether it's medical um, or um, national security for national, excuse me, security purposes. Um, and from, you know, either of you panelists, has this been something that um, you all have seen or yielded any um, uh, data for any of the projects that you guys have been on? I'm sorry, can you just clarify, what's sure. your question? Um, with the use of female engagement teams um, in uh, both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan working on um, global health issues and was wondering mm -hmm. if the use of them in uh, any of the public health projects that you all have been working on has uh, been of use. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Phil Castle, Global Cancer Initiative. Uh, Two quick questions. One is, could you uh, elaborate on your NGO engagement? You sort of touched on it, but you maybe could say more about that. And second question is more of a political question, which is local sensitivities of, of having the Chinese government involved in some of the Southeast Asian countries. Thank you. Uh, Commander Gustafson, and I was just wondering, I mean, the DOD, we do quite a bit of um, training of patient care providers and providing equipment, building clinics. But I'm curious to get your opinion on what do we do, what do we need to do more if we're already doing it, or what do we need to do if we're not doing it to really build partner capacity at a higher level? Because we could train all the people we want, but if the countries do not have a sound Ministry of Health, to facilitate a prolific 
healthcare system, we might be just you know, throwing good money after bad. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one last comment over here, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back to our panelists, and we'll, we'll go down this way, starting with Bernard. Hi, yes. my name is Pei Yang Lifang. I'm a Hmong American, specialized in global health law. And my question is, uh, what do you see the role of the diaspora, in, uh, I guess, in the US, in helping out with um, projects on global health in uh, the Mekong area? And then the second question would be, would you have examples of um, technical assistance, global health assistance programs that have actually promoted democracy in those countries that are, I guess, just emerging from um, from uh, authoritarian regimes. Okay, why, don't we, why don't we go down uh, our, our speakers and ask them to speak selectively according to which issues are directly relevant to each of them. Thank you. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give a little more information on the NGOs since I think that was directed to me. Um, again, if you look, uh, actually, there's a those who are interested in further details, there's a website, uh, President's Malaria Initiative web website, where we actually have our annual malaria operational plans for each country that are approved by this interagency group. And in there, you can actually see how the funding flows. And what you'll note is that um, I can't think of a country where there's not a significant piece of the funding that actually goes through an NGO because um, it's very much based on who's best positioned to do this. In most countries, it gets into this issue of, um, the systems in most countries are too weak to do everything they should be doing, so most countries are very welcoming of NGOs that um, actually have the, the experience to actually be able to do some of this. In the Mekong in particular, um, we have a grant to uh, an NGO. It was competed. It's a URC Keenan Institute grant to work on the Thai-Myanmar border in this area of Artemis and resistance. Um, and frankly, in some of these border areas, the NGOs actually have a a better reach than the governments themselves. So I'll just stop there, but if you actually want further details, you can actually go on and whatever country you're interested in in particular and look at the malaria operational plans where that's described. Thank you. Um, just to hit very quickly on a couple of the questions, I think that the question about the local perception of uh, um, Chinese uh, um, involvement uh, in the Lower Mekong, I think actually raises for me at least a, a broader question about this, which we try to pay uh, a, a very close attention to, which is local perceptions of outsiders, uh, countries, donor countries, and others getting involved in any way, shape, or form, and sort of how we do, and this is of course something that's you know, relevant to development assistance and uh, um, collaboration across the entire world, but it's something that we pay particular attention to, I think, because Again, coming back to one of my earlier points about the need for partner country buy-in and leadership on it. I think that, again, across anything that we're doing here in the health sphere or in any of the other uh, related areas in the Mekong, um, if we're going to be successful, we need partner country buy-in and leadership from it, which means inherently that I think they need to be supportive of the U.S. involvement or the involvement of any other country or, uh, you know, multilateral development bank um, or anyone else um, that's doing it and doing it fully in partnership with, hopefully, uh, again, partner country leadership in identifying what the issues are they need to work on with our support. Um, and then just very quickly, uh, I'd say um, to the question about how do we get at the training of higher level folks uh, in these local governments, and again, um, I'd mention what we're trying to do, at least with the Lower Mekong Initiative, as an example of it, in that recognizing that if we're going to get at some of these systemic issues that you're talking about here and actually building long-term capacity for, um, uh, you know, health care or, again, any other related development uh, issue, we're going to need to build capacity in the ministries um, in these uh, countries um, to build up their systems. And so that's one of the things that we focus on through the Lower Mekong, Lower Mekong Initiative, but USAID and other agencies have significant focus on that as well. Um, and I th again, I think it's making sure, just coming back finally to one of the points I made earlier, is making sure that those, the right folks from those ministries, the right levels, are not only ones that we're working with, but are also the ones that, that they're working with their c correct counterparts from their neighbors. Um, is an incredibly important uh, part of it. So, I'll stop there. I'll take on the uh, the female engagement teams um, <laughs> since I'm probably the one at the table that can do that. Um, having been in um, Afghanistan, the teams that I've worked with uh, were very effective 
to actually, because of cultural issues, we were not able to reach from a health point of view, um, in, particularly in conflict areas, because the NGOs primarily take care of it when it's not the conflict areas. But in the true conflict areas where there's a desperate need, we know in Afghanistan as an example that there, there has been um, a tremendous lack of health care availability to the females. And so what these teams allowed, because culturally men were not allowed to do it, quite frankly, uh, were to get into the villages and actually help in the most needy areas in uh, maternal and child health. So I think on balance they've been very successful in trying to open that up and um, develop a better understanding because we clearly know that in, in, particularly in that culture, the mom is the one that actually instills the health behaviors, the sanitation, all of those pieces. And so that's, that's really been, um, I think, a tremendous uh, asset to be able to use for that purpose. Scott, would you like to close for us? I was thinking about the question about training the higher level uh, health workers. It, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> We, we ran into this challenge in uh, the recent Middle East coronavirus uh, problem where um, it, it, uh, there, there's a serious lack of information about the virus and the epidemiology and so forth and uh, communicating with the lower levels of public health in the, in, the, in the area. It is possible to communicate effectively, but it seems as if when they brief the levels above them, there's a lack of communication. So one potential solution is to train field epidemiologists and then just wait for 20 years. Um, but there must be a better solution. Maybe some of the college students who are out there can think of the way forward. Thank you. We've um, had a very rich discussion. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. I want to again thank Admiral Peake, uh, I mean, Admiral Fallon, General Peake, for their leadership and their commitments. Uh, on this project, which we would not have been able to carry forward without your, without your contributions. Uh, uh, Chris Daniel, Lindsay Hammergren, who, who engineered our work with a very complicated set of activities, travels, meetings, and the like, and Admiral Cullison, who, who's made a deep personal commitment to uh, helping us move this along. And then, of course, to our panelists here today, Bernard Nalen, Michael Fuchs, uh, David Smith, Scott Dowell, to a great thank you to all of you for being here with us for this discussion. Please join me in thanking them.